Good evening, everybody. This is the beginning of a few seminars that we'll be doing as the WHO Collaborating Center for eHealth in collaboration and partnership with AHIN. And um, we'll talk about a variety of things that's in the handout. But um, the first webinar will be on data quality because that's fundamental to everything we do in health information. What I'd like to do tonight is to share with you, with you some of the work that we've done on data quality assessment and assessment frameworks on the use of real world data, all right, which is data that we collect in electronic health records and health information systems. I'll start now. This is the a webinar on data quality assessment framework for using with real world data. And for that, with that, I mean data collected as part of routine practice as a clinician or as a project manager in patient registries, in electronic health records, in information systems. In Australia, acknowledgement of country is a custom and it recognizes the first custodians of the land. So I acknowledge the Bedega people of the Euro nation as the first custodians of the land in which I work. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So, why are we concerned about data quality? My ultimate purpose is to be responsible to produce high quality real world evidence that is fit for purpose to be used by people like you and I. And for real world evidence to be fit for purpose, it needs to be calibrated, repeatable, reproducible, replicable, and generalizable. However, there are challenges to ensuring the quality of real world evidence. This include the quality of the real world data, the clinical validity, the software validity, the method validity. When communicating real world evidence, however, we should also report the uncertainty arising from the various challenges. With the Sydney, what a lot of what I'll be talking about will be based on a lot of work that we've done with our electronic practice based research network at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. This is a network of general practices and local health district facilities such as community health services, hospital services, emergency departments, and so on. This is the Sydney metropolitan Sydney, Southwest Sydney, and Central and Eastern Sydney. They each got about a million people in each area. And the kind of work we're doing with the EPBRN, the Electronic Practice Based Research Network, is to create real world data, uh, real world evidence to support connected health, integrated care. So, some of the programs we have as part of the EPBRN includes understanding how ready our facilities, general practices, and the people are ready to connect. So we explore their digital health capability maturity. The other stream of work is to connect data and systems. And here we develop tools to conduct data linkage, assess data quality, and harmonize our work to a common data model for interoperability purposes. And we are working on traditional data analytics as well as machine learning technologies. The next piece of work is to connect services and professionals. So it's got to do with continuity of care, multi-level integrated care, and so on, including telehealth and mHealth, mobile health. Finally, the connection, the, the fourth stream of work is to connect citizens and community. And we got, we are interested in health alliances, which includes hospital facilities, general practices, uh, networks, and local government working together to support and sustain health services, including integrated health services. Part of this is includes social enterprise as well as partnerships with businesses and the New South Wales Ministry of Health. So that's kind of the broad range of program which 
with we are dealing with data all the time, which is why data quality is an important aspect of our work. So the EPBRN platform is fairly straightforward. It is framed within a health neighborhood and an information ecosystem. We extract the, the neighborhood includes people like general practices and patients using apps and wearables to provide to contribute some of the information to what we collect in the data repository. We also have <coughs> emergency departments, community health centers, and outpatient clinics and hospitals where we also extract data and we link them. All right, but before we link them, we anonymize them. And after we have anonymized it, we extract the data, transform it to the common data model, and load it into a secure server within a firewall um, server farm. And this is a secure SQL database with a data linkage tool called Granite. So after manipulating and, and at this point in time, the data is already anonymized. So we're dealing with anonymized data all the time. So the standardized database that we have after we done the data linkage and clean it and harmonize it to a common data model, we use it for research in this situation. So as I mentioned, we talk, we are using machine learning as well as traditional biostatistics to do patient level prediction and population level estimation studies, as well as um, analytics and characterization of different cohorts. So once we got this, and this will be accessible to users who will have to be accredited and um, approved to be to use this data for various purposes that I've just mentioned. Another important focus of this data after we clean it and everything and summarize it and characterize the cohorts and measure the data quality is to feed it back to the the actor, the people who have contributed the data, the GPs and the people in the various facilities. And that way we have a quality assurance and quality improvement cycle, the quality of the data. And then obviously through the common data model, which is a CDM, this is um, OMOP stands for Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership. It's an international common data model, where, which enable us to participate in international cohort studies and clinical trials. So that's, can you hear me, Char? That's, is that, can you hear, uh, there's no audio problem? Yes. Good. Okay, so next slide. The other thing I want to talk about is also um, the My Health Record, which is the Australian um, national health record that is comprised of information derived from patients and from healthcare professionals. The patient is, is called my health record because the patient controls access to the health record. So the my health record data repository is in, an important one because it is, the EPBRN data is only in Sydney. It's a small data set, about 200,000 patients, all right? Maybe a couple of million transactions, but it's growing all the time at this point in time. But my health record is a national data set. It covers, supposed to cover according to the law, the, the, all the population. The My Health Records Act of 2012 enables the release of medical uh, My Health Record data for research and public health. This requires research. It has an opt out consent model based on legislation in 2017. Because at that point in time, in 2012, the response rate was, there was, it was very impractical to get consent from patients 
and part and participants and our citizens to, to participate. So the law was changed to so you are in the system until you opt out. And as I mentioned, the system data, my health record data consists of patient summaries uploaded from participating facilities, general practice, hospitals, anything. All right. Um, there's, um, there are two layers to this available data. Obviously, there's the metadata and the clinical content, which conforms to HL7 standard. So with that background, let's have a look at what we mean and what we understand from our, my, my, our perspective, data quality and fitness for purpose. Data quality is a fundamental requirement. All right. And we've done, we've had, and it covers a range of domains in clinical and biomedical science. And we approach the data quality as, um, and challenges across the data production and curation life cycle, which is this. The real world data is generated in, through this process from sources of data, which might be a clinical practice, a genetic database, a disease registry, and so on, and for patients themselves, collected in information systems and EHRs, which may be standalone or may be linked in the network. Data is extracted from this primary databases along the lines of what I described with the EPBRN, and it's usually anonymized. And this is then sits in the secondary database, what I describe as the EPBRN data repository of pseudonymized um, patients. It's here that we talk about um, good management and good governance and good provenance of the data before as and to make so that we can make data available for people to use. I will go into detail about these aspects of interoperability and management of the um, database in a minute. But in addition to this, the provenance of the data is very important, knowing where the data comes from and the quality. So how credible is the source of the data? So the provenance of the primary source and the provenance of the secondary source is very important. This is highlighted in the top row. Obviously, governance is very important, and we talk about consent from patients. Uh, or in the My Health Records uh, context, it is an opt out consent. Same thing with the EPBRN, it's an opt out consent model. Local data governance here, so there's committees looking at how we manage the data and how. Uh, how we make it accessible to people to use locally. And similarly, in the secondary database situation, the data quality is also important at both local and secondary levels, which essentially is the source data and, and the, and the um, secondary database, a data warehouse. So we lo looked at the plausibility or the believability of the information the conformance of the information to standards, the missingness, the completeness, and, and yeah, the three main categories of um, data quality. And as I mentioned about the feedback, um, data quality dashboards, so that there's a cycle of data quality improvement. So that's kind of the real world data production and curation life cycle. So how, what do we mean by high quality, good data quality? Wang and Strong de defi um, defined data quality long time ago, and their work is still being um, they're still their work is still being contextually appropriate, clearly represented, and accessible to data consumers. Accessible data leads us to the fair guiding principles, which I'll go into detail in this slide. So the fair stands for findability, accessibility interoperability and reusability. 
these are guiding principles for scientific data management and stewardship, often referred to as data custodianship, which includes a governance uh, component. So findable, usually we talk about metadata. Accessible, we talk about making the, the, the data accessible through digital object identifies the DOI that you use to access bibliographic databases. The same thing, we have database object identifiers. Interoperability refers to standards and reusability is important so that other researchers can validate your work and use your information to do new work. So that's kind of the important principles underlying people be used by users, such as in my case, the EPBRN, or in the case of the Australian government, in this case, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare for the My Health Record data. Now, Wang and Strong also mentioned intrinsic and contextual data quality features. Intrinsic data quality features involve only the data values in their own right, without any reference to external requirements or tasks. So that's kind of the pure data assessment. Contextual data quality features typically entail unique contextual or task specific data quality requirements. So that's where the fit for purpose definition of data quality comes in. And hope you, I hope you become clearer as I go into the assessment framework and talk about different categories of data quality. We did, we did a literature review in 2013 when we had started to deal with EPBRN data, and this was published in the International Journal of Medical Informatics, we found there was a lot of similar concepts in the researchers who were working in this field at that time. There was no agreed taxonomy of the intrinsic and contextual data quality factors. So there was a lot of work being done, but there's no harmonization. So this was with colleagues in the UK, and, uh, and in Australia. And with that background, we, we subsequently in 2016 collaborated with colleagues in USA, including Michael Kahn at, um, at, at the uh, Data Quality Collaborative, in, uh, which is based in, well, Arkansas in, uh, in the States. And we developed a taxonomy of intrinsic data quality purely the data, left out the contextual stuff, because there was too many people doing different things in that space. And it's very hard to, to uh, try to harmonize it. However, for the intrinsic data quality categories, we harmonize the terminology and the methodology. So we recently in 2019, in 2016, we um, did a, literature review to update the model that we came up, the framework that we came up in 2016. So the objective, and this was funded by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, with the objective of analyzing the state of the art of data quality assessment, the coverage and maturity of data quality frameworks, measures, tools, and use cases in public health and research. And this was part of their role as data custodian of the My Health Record program. We use the PRISMA guidelines and looked at published and uh, great literature. The sources being Scopus, ProQuest, MCAT, and so on, along with reports from the great literature published by the Australian government, Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, the Australian Digital Health Agency, and Australian Bureau of Statistics. So the starting point, as I mentioned, was the framework in 2016 that you saw in the previous slide the data production and the curation life cycle that you saw in the in a previous slide and the fair guiding principles. Those are the kind of the frameworks that guided the literature review. So we, with the literature review, we started off with 800 papers identified from a broad search, but after we removed duplicates and screened the papers, titles and abstracts and full text, which led us from 500 plus to 141 full text. And after we excluded 
review the full text, we exclude another 20, and we ended up with 120 to review, to extract the data and review and synthesize the information, along with guidance from the great literature from the Australian government and Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. So with this background, that's what we, we were, that's what, how we came about to the data quality assessment framework, which I'll talk about now. The data quality framework now covers both intrinsic and contextual data quality. The intrinsic is in gray and the contextual data quality categories are in green, <coughs> in the green um, cells. So there are three categories of intrinsic data quality. Conformance, which is conformance to the metadata, the data model, specifications and standards specific for the data set. All right, so we look at homogeneity and conformance. And this can be subcategorized into value conformance, all right, values of the data, relational conformance, relationships between the different data elements and computational because you actually calculate some secondary variables out of the primary variables. So it's important to check that the conformance is adequate and done correctly. Uh, so that's an, one source of um, data quality that we need to focus on. Completeness is the second category and the definition is pretty obvious. Data, data found in the data set divided by what we expect. Plausibility is a little bit harder to measure, but plausibility is defined as believability, and it is defined as a unique value, the uniqueness factor, subcategory, or a range or pattern at one time point or over two or more time points. So you talk about a temporal, there's no time involved, and temporal where you actually look at how it varies over time. All right, those of you who are involved in uh, looking up the information systems will know that the data is continuous. Yeah, it changes, well, it's added on every day. So those are some, of, those are the three categories and subcategories that we developed in the 2016 model for intrinsic data quality. Okay, and there, and the contextual data quality has been added on after this review in 2019. And we subcategorized them into organizational network and governance and technical and informatics subcategories. So the informatics one are pretty obvious. All right, you look at operating platform and a common data models and so on. And um, the organizational stuff, you look, and especially in the network of information systems, you look at timeliness of data, right, how it gets to the data repository so that you actually have good data. In, the, in this time of pandemics, we need timely data to be able to start to make decisions. So this is a very good time to start thinking about data quality, all right? And we know with coronavirus, with the COVID-19, that there are lots of questions about data quality all through the data curation life cycle. So in addition to these categories, there are indicators developed, and I'll show you some, quickly show you some indicators in the subsequent slides. And obviously there are tools that have been developed to do this. And I, if time permits, I'll do a quick demonstration of one of the tools. The intrinsic data quality indicators includes things like um, for value, relational, so you've seen this, this before, the, the, the indicators. But examples of indicators in the bottom includes things like total symmetrically consistent rows divided by total rows. Number of known divided by unknown data types, right? looking at consistency. Right? So if we see, look for conformance within the, and try to verify it within the, the um, data set, it, it has to make sense. The other um, mechanism to assess data quality is validation. 
So you get verification against the data set or against the organizational conventions, but you have a validation across, a validation towards a benchmark, which is usually a national standard or an international standard. So all three intrinsic data quality indicators, conformance, completeness, and plausibility can be verified or validated by the definition that I just mentioned, either we intrinsically against either the data set itself or the organizational conventions or against a national or international benchmark. We have all these, um, we have all these indicators and we have this framework that will give you this information. It's important that you ask questions for it from the perspective of either the health services, research or improvement, public health service provision, or research and evaluation. So you ask what are the essential data elements for each domain of use? What are the relevant data quality category or subcategory for each data element that we are collecting? What are the relevant measures for each indicator, which might, be, might need a few data elements to answer, to, to measure? How would you weight the data quality categories all right, of the various elements? And some um, tools actually give you a global measure, overall measure of data quality. All right, so how useful is that? How well does it represent each of the categories or the subcategories when you get to a global measure for data quality? So those are, those are some of the questions we need to answer or address as we go along in how we deal with our databases and the quality of our databases. So there are a lot, so I'll keep going and I'll take questions at the end because I think there's a bit of time constraint here with a bit of an audio problem we're having. So we looked at the, the literature and there were lots of papers with data quality assessment reported. So papers that address data quality issues in, include the, a lot of, uh, publications from informatics journal. So they look at EHR data quality of various data elements, interoperability, instruments, and statistically looking at the probability di distributions of the different data elements and groups of data elements in a data set. Obviously, completeness is one uh, important thing, and a possibility similar thing. They look for they, a lot of reports on some of these. Um, aspects of uh, data quality, intrinsic ones. In the contextual um, category, there's quite a lot of um, work as well. All right, organizational data quality um, uh, as, as indicators. That um, includes things like data quality improvement, uh, processes and uh, outcomes process mining, transparency of data sets, and uh, transparency of governance of data sets. So there's a whole bunch of organizational um, um, activities. There's uh, metadata work. The Australian Health Institute of Health and Welfare has got the metadata online registry called Meteor. There's um, various household data that, can, that, that, peop that people have looked at and uh, continuing, continuing care re reporting. So regulations have been looked at um, quite frequently. And um, in the technical area, we look at data infrastructure and common data model, the queries, the tools, standards, security, privacy, confidentiality, and so on. So there's lots of work done in informatics kind of perspective of data quality. There's also lots of work done in the public health and uh, health services and research areas. So similar, there's, don't, try, don't worry about trying to understand this slide. I, I think we can make the slides available. It's just to show you the wide range of activities going on in terms of data quality assessment in public health services, in health services and research. All right, so just to show you that there's lots of thinking going on in this area around the world. I just keep provide a bit of use case from one of the examples in the in the previous slide. So we're looking at um, 
well child care, child development, right? maternal and child health. So we're looking at the child part of it. So here the examples I've given here are in my health record. So it's, think of your context in your country. What sort of data have you got that's equivalent to my health record? What have you got in terms of patient registries or EHRs and so on? Because my health record is, has got information, is basically information derived uh, from electronic health records and information systems as patient summaries and aggregated in a data repository. The acronyms here refer, MBS refers to the Australian Medicare Benefits Schedule, which is a big database of services used. The Pharmaceutical Benefits Schedule, a big database of medications prescribed and dispensed. And the Australian Immunization Register, which is a database of immunization. So they, they tend to have patient information like patient details, a bit of family history, provider details, visits, date and time, provider sites, date and time, diagnosis with a date and often time, medications prescribed, type, strength, dose, frequency, amount, date, uh, prescribe and dispense. So they, you tend to have those kind of data. So we don't need to collect those data again, but depending on our research questions, we might have to develop that, uh, collection, data collection tools to collect extra information. So a lot of Australian um, data has limited information on socioeconomic status. So you might have to collect this extra data. Now breastfeeding history, yes, in specialized databases, but depending on which databases you're talking about. So you might have, depending on what your, your research question is, you might have to collect the information to augment, to complement what's available in real world data. So, you know, things like Edinburgh postpartum scores, postpartum depression scores are not routinely collected except in specialized databases. So those are some of the things you need to think about in the way you manage your data sets and how you're going to get your data sets to quality assess them so that they are fit for purpose. It's important when we're dealing with um, health services research, uh, health service improvement, because a lot of data is being used from real world data to examine and to support clinical quality improvement. So monitoring, con continuing professional development and so on, but clinical quality improvement is a key um, function that real world data supports. And most of you, well, it depends on what job will you do? Clinical improvers, quality, quality improvement stages include definition of the problem, measuring the, the problem and measuring the effect of your intervention, analyze your data, your findings, and establish, uh, introduce an improvement, and um, maintain and control, monitor the um, improvement. So that's different data needs at different points in of the quality improvement cycle. So for the definition stage, you need to do research and audit of existing real world data. Management reports to help you to measure the extent of the problem. Operational reports plus management reports to help you analyze the problem. Improvement, all right, you need to have point of care reporting. Collect the data, add on, and start to analyze and see how whether you're monitoring the improvement or not. And control, you need to use the real world data that you collect on, go, in a, on an ongoing basis to improve your decisions. So there are different tools, all right? So like decision support, alerts, automated registers, and so on. Dashboards for to help quality improvement, online analytical processing, and so on. So that's kind of in the space of service improvement and service provision. Now, whether it, as a child development domain or in maternal, health domain or chronic disease management or acute care. This is a relevant one. You're talking about um, public health use case of influenza surveillance, or in this case, where relevant to us now, COVID-19 surveillance. Available data, okay, if you look at trying to monitor and surveil patients. 
what's available in routinely collected real world data sets, observational data, but what else do we need, all right, to, to, um, to monitor the effect of, in this case, flu, but it could be COVID-19. So do we need information from ICU admissions, hospital admissions, so all the different tests and so on, pathology. So you have the different countries where different levels of readiness, but these are some of the important questions to answer to um, see what the data is available and how good it is. So completeness, conformance, and plausibility. As I said, there are lots of questions being asked about different data from different countries that have got, been through, that are currently going through the pandemic. Right from the, beginning, from the time of the quality of the test, accuracy of the test and so on, right through the reporting of the morbidity and so on. So those are important considerations. That's a, the reason I put this in here is because we're talking about STIs, uh, sexually transmitted infections and indigenous communities. The only reason I put it here is to that there is some interesting work done with machine learning to understand some aspects of clinical management in Aboriginal patients in Australia. So similar kind of issues with the data, but in terms of um, machine learning and artificial intelligence, we need to think about the same in the using the same framework, right? Whether you're a public health service provider, you, whether you're interested in health services improvement or research. With AI, the use cases are essentially decision support. The benefits are decision support, pattern recognition, predictive modeling, business analytics, and the risk use cases for use of AI and AI methods such as deep learning methods, include unreliability, risk of errors, risk of bias, and that, that, uh, harm to patients, iatrogenesis. So this is especially when you talk about unsupervised AI. So something you think about, I mean, errors and unreliability are obvious, but the question of bias, all right, some of you, I mean, you would have heard of reports in the literature about um, inequitable um, service provision as a result of bias algorithms um, in terms of hospital bed use, in terms of um, operations performed and so on. You know, the difference between, um, in, in this is one of the examples is uh, in uh, the States, a study in the States of um, using insurance databases and using AI that you actually increase the inequity between the black, black, America, um, black Americans and non-black Americans or African Americans and non-African Americans in terms of equity of access to care. So think of the bias as part of your data quality assessment. I think I posted this to the data quality collaborative. And I think most, are, most people that seem to think that bias should be part of data quality assessment. And there are, as a, so when you talk about some of these challenges, um, the data, there are data quality challenges across the life cycle. And these are some of the challenges to the quality of the real world evidence we want to provide from good data from electronic health records and information systems. So there's problems at the data gathering and integration stage. Remember the data life cycle, the production and the curation. Problems, you know, in terms of poor errors in data entry, you know, errors in joining of tables in an EHR and issues of missing values, data storage, and data knowledge sharing, right? lack of documentation about the data model and different interpretations and implementations of the data model, lack of metadata, data analysis is involving incorrect data transformations, incorrect 
um, use of inappropriate um, interpretation and so on. And also data publishing is also a source of error, all right, in terms of use of the, um, using the data that's produced by the system. And then in terms of making it look nice in tables and figures and so on, errors can happen as well. This is an example of example of how what can happen when you use transform data to a common data model. We did a study with our EP Baron data set before and after we transform it into the common data model and looked at the data quality before and after and see whether there was any change in the data quality. And um, there were some, but they were not because of intrinsic data quality errors, but more because of the conventions and other um, secondary use of the data in the sense that um, how we deal with missing values, whether it's a null value or an absent value and so on. So the conventions can cause problems. And as I said, now that we looked at some of the issues and challenges and so on, there are some tools that's being um, used for data quality assessment. So this is uh, an example of Achilles. It's a data, uh, 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 data monthly trend uh, analysis tool that looks at um, monthly trend data from the common data model in a collaborative study. So this shows you quite just, uh, dramatically that when the terminology changed from ICD-9 to ICD-10, you know, if you look at it, depressive disorders, there's a, in ICD-9, there's a drastic drop. And there's a ICD-10 here, and there's an increase, all right? So simple example of indicators to show um, how we look at individual indicators and measure the data quality and then put it all together. So this is um, looking at diabetes uh, prevalence, all right, using the diagnosis code. So when they changed the reimbursement rules, there was an increase. So money talks, all right. So in this case, so um, the, the, I'm looking at the data quality dashboard for this community called Observational Health Data Science and Informatics. This is the community that uses and endorses the common data model that I use. So they've looked at plausibility, conformance, completeness, and they look at verification and validation. As I mentioned before, verification is against the organization itself or the data set itself, looking at all right, conformance to the meta model, meta mo metadata, and so on, the model, and so on. And validation is against a national or international benchmark. So you look at the individual elements, right? They look at of the data set. So some data sets might have thousands of um, elements. But in this case, they look at hundreds of um, different elements that represent plausibility or conformance or completeness. And there was a pass rate of 88%, right? Out of 180 and so on, you know, looking at the pass and fail, 88% to, to 96% with an average of 94%. And when you look at it overall, 95%. So how useful is this? I mean, we know how useful the individual measures are, but how useful is this in terms of saying your data set is fit for purpose? Something you need to think about. So to summarize, I've tried to go through it, go through it quite quickly because of the for uh, the audio problems we had before. So <clears throat> real world data and real world evidence to be fit for purpose, they must be calibrated, repeatable, reproducible, replicable, and generalizable. You need to report that. All right. You need to report the quality of your data. You need to report how you need to report how well the software performed, the fillet, the, you know, what are the sources of errors in the software itself that contributed to data quality errors and the methods, all right, whether it had any effect on the data quality. 
So to find to finish off. The balancing of quality and security data with the fair guiding principles for the findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability of a real world data asset for public good and scientific advancement requires a culture of good documentation. Remember the data production and curation life cycle at the left, right? Good documentation by the data creators, the clinicians, and the data collectors, the researchers, and so on. Requires good data management. That includes right, extraction, transformation, loading, linkage, and cleaning. And um, curating it to, to be fit for purpose for use by you and I. And good data governance and good reporting. And that means that you and I need to be good data creators and good data collectors and good data managers. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Professor Tang. So uh, I sent a message to all our participants if they have questions. There's a message, Professor. So this question is how to make sure the quality in data capture in developing country? Data capture. That's at, the, at this side of the cycle. So depending on whether you're a researcher, collecting information. All right, there is, I guess, number one, take it back one step, good training of the data collector in to, to understand why the data is being collected and what is it for. Because if you want to make a mistake, it's very hard to go back to the source and get the information again. So the data collector needs to be well trained in uh, understanding especially the why the data is being collected whether it's for a chronic disease registry or whether it's for you know obstetric data for maternal child health and not maternal health it, it is in, or whether just looking at the prevalence of malaria or you know or in this case i'll be looking at um, uh, contact tracing you know so I think that data collection, the data collector needs to be well trained and especially not just generally to understand the value of data, but to understand why the data is collected for that particular purpose. Because you, you, know, you can't just collect data without a purpose. For the data collector who is a clinician as well, I think that's part of, they usually call the data creators, I call them the data creators because they actually talk to the patient in, for real world data. And um, and also and and um, work out what exactly what are the symptoms, uh, whatever the research question. Is, if we're looking at, you know, looking at um, STI surveillance, all right. So those questions are, needs to be asked specifically from both a special data collector point of view as well as the clinician who is collecting it as part of his daily work. Okay, so is understanding that documentation is very important. All right. And um, sometimes we take shortcuts as clinicians. I'm a clinician myself, so sometimes we take shortcuts. All right. And we don't, the data doesn't get entered. But most times you can impute the data from other data that's entered. So that's part of the um, use, the, the, shall we say, the skills you need to understand real world data from clinical, especially with clinical systems. So to answer your question, the data collection, the data collector, whether you're collecting it as a special research project or special service provision project, or it's important that you have the basic things about what I said at the end, um, uh, good documentation, good management, and good governance. So the data collector is not on his or her own. Does that, and then obviously, you know, there's, you can collect, that data collection can be from databases, from like data monitoring equipment, from wearables and so on. So, so that is also important for the person you're collecting the data from, the patient or the family member or the client or the healthy citizen, if you're going to collect data from their 
wearables or their watches or their Fitbits and so on, they also need to understand that they need to have it on the number one, you know, and um, use it so that they can contribute to the data. I hope that answers your question. Uh, thank you, Professor Tang. So we have another question. This is from Dr. Raymond. So how helpful is it for countries to participate in OHCSI efforts and would you recommend it? I think, well, I'm biased, but I think it's very, very helpful uh, for you, for, for us in terms of um, interoperability of our data, standards-based. If we don't have good standardized data sets, uh, not just locally, but also regionally, nationally, and um, internationally, we're not going to be able to make use of it to improve our decisions for policy and practice. So if you look at, say, the o OHDSI, all right, the group, say with the, we've done a lot of research as an international collaborative looking at management of risk factors like hypertension. What's the optimal management in terms of, say, like we use the first line antihypertensives. Okay, or the first line anti diabetic agent. So, met metformin, right? There's lots of randomized control trials done, but about five or six years ago, this community actually pulled all the data together across the about 30 countries and came out and said, yes, metformin is the best drug for first line anti uh, diabetes. And more recent example is COVID 19. The community got together and started to develop a protocol to test um, the efficacy. And this is prospective, not, not retrospective, retrospective, to use real world data to test the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine. So it is possible you know, and in, important for us to participate in this kind of international efforts because the, the COVID-19 doesn't recognize any boundary, all right? If we can understand from sharing your data, not sharing the data, but sharing the results of your data, of the analysis of your data, you know, using a common data model. So your data sits in your own data sets, in your own server and so on. But the, the data that's relevant to the common data model to answer particular research questions, in this case, hydroxychloroquine, is shared. I mean, you, need, you need the common data model to do that easily. It can help us answer the question of how good hydroxychloroquine is, but you know, it could be completely useless. Well, it probably is now, but you know, we don't know. So I think my, I'm biased, but I think we need that kind of um, uh, approach to our own data so we can verify it for our own purposes, but we can also validate our own data against an international benchmark. Does that make sense? Hello, Professor Tang. So thank you. Uh, I think that's the last question. So we can wrap up tonight's session. Thank you for uh, making time for us, Professor Tang, and to all our participants. Uh, we have succeeding webinars in this webinar series, so we hope to see you again on the following Mondays at 6 p.m. Manila time. Thank you, Professor Tang. Yeah, and thanks for listening. Thank you.